Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Friends, welcome back to this lecture number 14 on the series on human behavior. So, just for a little recap of what we have been doing up till now, I will recount all that we have covered. So, we started off by defining human behavior and pointing out that psychology is the science of doing human behavior. Then we looked at where did this psychology come from, its historical roots, its various schools, how these schools interact with each other and then through this process explaining a little bit of history of psychology which is the science which studies human behavior. Further to it, I also discussed some tools, methods that we use in psychology for studying human behavior. So, the course on human behavior started off well with the definition of the science of psychology which studies human behavior. So, behavior we described is any action or reaction that a person does in response to either an external or an internal stimuli. And so, in the natural sequence, the second step was to discuss how do human beings translate external stimuli in the environment which is outside of them or even within them into the psychological domain. And then we discussed the idea about sensor receptors which are organs which code the external stimulus or the external environment into the psychological domain. We looked at sensitivities and sensory coding, these are the properties of the uh, sensory systems. We further looked at some more elaboration on uh, the sensory receptors and towards the end we took a model system which is the human eye and looked at how human eye codes sensory information. So, for any human to give any behavior or response, the first step would be to code or to understand what is coming from the stimulus in the external environment. Once you are able to code, this code has to be then narrated or explained in terms of the language of the brain and that is called perception. It is the idea or the process or a bunch of systems and processes which make meaning from the sensory information which has been encoded through the sensory receptors. And so, we started off by looking at what is perception, how is meaning generated. We looked at the need for two eyes, we looked at how human eye perceives depth and the process of recognizing external stimuluses, pattern recognition, the process of ab uh, abstraction and constancies which are uh, used by the brain to make meaning. So, once we understand what the external stimulus means, we need to learn it and then came the section on learning. In the section of learning, what we did was we looked at what is learning? So, learning is basically changing our behavior or changing behaving in a certain way in response to what has been acquired through perception. 
So, we looked at two basic types of learning. We looked at the reflex type of learning which is uh, non-associative and the associative form of learning. We discussed habituation and sensitization as the reflexive or non-associative form of learning and then we discussed classical conditioning which is reward contingent learning. So, a reward is given upfront for a person to change his behavior or to learn. Operant conditioning in which the consequence of the behavior leads to the reward or punishment as the matter may be and observation learning in which a person observes a role model doing a particular behavior and learns from the role model what is the appropriate behavior in a particular situation. So, this classes of learning or this uh, whole process of how do we acquire knowledge or how do we extract knowledge from the meaning that has been generated through perception. Once the knowledge has been gathered and this knowledge is stored somewhere, so that at a future date when a situation this uh, like the similar situation, a situation like a previous situation occurs, the most optimal behavior could be displayed and this process of storing is what is memory. So, we started off by discussing what is memory. We looked at the definitions of memory or the understanding of memory in terms of the Gibsonian view and the complex view of memory. Then we discussed two important viewpoints of looking at memory, the Atkinson and Schiffen model and the idea about parallel processing model. We then focused on the idea of working memory which is an extension of the idea of short term memory and finished our discussion by looking at the kind of information which is stored into long term memory. So, in elaborate we discuss the idea of what is short term memory, long term memory, factors affecting it, all those kind of things. So, once we were done with memory, we moved into the idea of intelligence that is what we did in the last class. We looked at what is intelligence and how does it really work. So, we we'll, we'll define the concept of intelligence and we also looked at uh, how intelligence is basically defined and why it is difficult to understand intelligence. Now, in the previous lecture which is 13 we discussed the two popular notions of intelligence, which is the idea that intelligence is a single factor based property and the idea that intelligence is a multi factor based property. This is exactly the difference between what Spearman says intelligence is and what Thurston says intelligence is. Spearman believes that everybody has a g factor and this g factor is responsible for all the intelligence in the world. And then this g factor correlates to some specific factors which are called the s factors. These specific factors are situation related intelligences. Thurston on the other hand believes that there is no g factor, there is no basic intelligence, but there are different intelligences which combine together to form the concept of intelligence. We started defining or evaluating the idea of multifaceted theory of intelligence with the theory of Thurston and uh, the extension of this theory through Gardner, where he talks about 7 or 8 intelligence types. We moved on to the concept of Anderson's information processing theory of intelligence, where we looked at intelligence not only as the speed of how quickly somebody processes information, but also dependent on development of certain modules which could be characterized intelligence. We looked at the idea of Stenberg's triarchic theory of intelligence which says that intelligence is three types. Intelligence is performance based, intelligence is experience based, intelligence is environment based. So, three different types of intelligence and we discussed this in detail. 
And the last theory that we did was Cattle's idea of fluid uh, and, and uh, intelligence and then the idea of CCs that is what you are seeing on the board right now, the concept of CCs theory of intelligence which says that the environment has a lot of role to play into intelligence. So, what are we going to do today? What we are going to do today is we are going to look at how do we measure intelligence first of all. So, we look at a standard test of intelligence because more applicable than the idea of intelligence is the concept of how intelligence is measured. So, we look at how any intelligence test is actually created first of all, what are the parameters of those tests, how it is created, how did the intelligence measurement started because intelligence is all about terms of measurement in terms of numbers. So, what is the meaning of that? Then we look at some basic ideas in terms of theories of intelligence, measurement. So, where it started, how it is measured, different forms of intelligence tests and finally, we look at a model system of intelligence which is called emotional intelligence. Nowadays, there are several concepts of intelligence like emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence and so on and so forth. So, we look at a model system which is the idea of emotional intelligence and creativity. So, let us start by looking at two parameters of what an intelligence test should have and how these parameters define what an intelligence test is or how good an intelligence test is. Now, for those of you there who have had gone to schools, who had school counsellors and have done intelligence tests, they would be familiar that most intelligence tests tend to have several questions on them. It could be numerical ability, it could be verbal ability, it could be uh, performance ability, it could be a number of abilities, special ability and so on and so forth. So, most intelligence tests have a number of abilities, but then let us look at a standard test, let us look at how test is constructed and two parameters of any intelligence test, let us start by looking at that because as I said more interesting than the idea of intelligence is the idea of intelligence test. So, we start off by looking at how intelligence is assessed, now assessment of intelligence, key that they measure what they intend to measure. Intelligence test, the key to any intelligence test, whether it is Weschler's intelligence test or it is uh, Binet's intelligence test or for that matter any intelligence test, the key to any intelligence test is that it actually measures what they intend to measure. And as I said, there are several types of intelligence tests. You can have a ability based intelligence test you can have a academic based intelligence test, you can have a performance based intelligence test and so there can be several types of intelligence tests. Now, we will move into the idea of how this works, but before we go there let us look at two factors or parameters which affect intelligence tests. The first factor is called reliability. What is reliability of a test? Let us say that we go to a cloth house, a cloth merchant and we get 1 meter cloth. So, you go to any shop which sells cloth and you ask them to give 1 meter of cloth. How do they measure? Now, if he is a genuine person, he will take out a scale, a 1 meter scale is there, would have seen a metal scale and he measures the cloth against that scale and he cuts the cloth for you. Now, if I do this on n different shops of cloth, what I will get is nearly equal cloths. How am I getting nearly equal cloths? The idea is that the scale is reliable, the metal scale is reliable. What does reliability then generally mean? It means that no matter how many times I measure on a time basis on a time axis 
or time dependent, the measurements will not change. So, if I do a measurement again and again at different points of time of something, whether it is measuring a cloth through the same scale, the measurements will not change drastically and that is reliability. So, the concept of reliability is defined as a test with good reliability will yield reproducible and consistent results. The key words here are reproducible which means that in a cloth example, if we take the cloth and we measure it across 6 or 7 shops, the measurement will be more or less same. So, reproducible or if we get a cloth from one shop and take it to the other shop and ask them to measure it, it will be same. The 1 meter, 2 meter, whatever you are buying, it would be same and that is reliability, that is reproducible and consistent results, consistent in the sense that across time. So, if I do it across periods of time, let us say today, tomorrow, 5 days, 15 days, 1 month, 4 months, 10 months, whenever I do this test, then the measurement that I get of the cloth is consistent, it does not change whatever measurement I get on one scale. So, say a uh, shop 1 says it is 1.1 meter and shop 2 says it is 1.3 meters, 1.03 meters and 1.01 meter and if I do a test today and I again go back let us say after 30 days, the same results I will get in shop 1 and shop 2 of the cloths that I have and that is called consistency. So, no matter what I do, how many times I go there, the results are not only reproducible but also consistent. So, how do I measure reliability? The measurement of reliability is done by correlating two set of scores, which means that the measurements that I am getting say if shop 1 is giving me 1.1 meter and shop 2 is giving me uh, 1 1.01 1 .01 meters and it is 1.02 meters and so on and so forth and when I correlate this score. So, shop 1 10 readings I take 1.1 meter next time 1.00 uh, 1.02 meters then 1.00 meters and so on and so forth see that these are 10 readings for shop 1 and again for shop 2 and then I run a small correlation between them. What is correlation? If two variables they change in synchrony which basically means that if there are two measurement variables a and b and whenever a makes a change in it or a, a shifts itself in position this leads to change in the position of b also by either equal amount or some fixed amount then they are said to be correlating which means that a happens and b also happens it may be possible that they are not correlating at the same length and it might be that if A increases B may also decrease and that there would be different uh, amounts also. But when A happens B also happens at the same time in terms of temporal fixation then we say that they are correlating. So, here if I have a score like this and I run a simple correlation rho is what a correlation is and I get a correlation like 0 0.7. I say that these scores are high correlation, high positive correlation which means that both the shops are giving near equal results, right? Both the shops are giving near equal measurements and so the scales that you are using are reliable. That is one uh, the metal scale that they use for cutting the cloth is reliable. So, reliability is measured through this kind of a assessment. Now, there are several types of reliability. One form of reliability is called the test retest reliability, which is person takes a test twice, scores correlate. In test retest reliability, what happens is assume that I go to shop 1 for measurement on day 1, I get 1.01, the same shop on day 5, I get 1.001, and then day 30, I get something let us say 1.2, 1.02 and so on and so forth. And when I run a correlation between these, 
different base cores and if it is highly significant this is called test rate reliability. In terms of what, what has been explained here suppose a person A takes intelligence test 1 and then again takes the same A again takes the intelligence test 1 with a time difference between them. So, once they do the test and then again do the retest. So, let us say it at 10 am he takes the first test and at 4 pm he takes the test again. Now, if the scores are correlating between test 1 and test 2 or the cores are similar between test 1 and test 2 then we say that the tests are have something called test retest reliability. There is another way to test reliability which is called the alternate form reliability. Here what happens is that two forms of the same test correlate highly. So, what we tend to do here is that let us say that test 1 or intelligence test 1 and intelligence test 2 are two versions of the same test. Okay. We have seen this right, you have given your examinations uh, JE examinations, your uh, CBS examinations, what happens is you get multiple set of papers. Now, these sets do not vary too much, what happens is only the questions are different and so there are two or three versions of the test. Now, similarly, if there are two versions of the same test, intelligence test and the same both the versions are taken by let us say person A. So, it takes version 1 and gets a score say SC1 and takes version 2 and gets a score SC2. And when I do the correlation between scores SC1 and SC2 and they correlate very highly which means that the row value if this score increases this also increases on certain items and this score decreases then this score also decreases on certain items which means that the row value is greater than 7.0 0.7 I say that they are correlating highly and the test is found known to have something called alternate form reliability. What has happened is two forms of the test same test is taken by people and they both the forms when the person performs on them they show high reliability. The third form of reliability is called the internal consistency reliability test items correlate highly with each other. Let us say I have an intelligence test IT1. Now, IT1 measures three abilities academic ability or I will uh, let us say verbal ability, performance ability and special ability. Verbal ability will have questions related to verbal things for example, uh, there will be passages things like uh, if this is greater than that that kind of a thing or, or some passage to decode from. Performance ability will be certain questions which make you perform. So, mathematical ability kind of a thing and special ability will be certain rotation example. So, if cube A rotates to this degree what it is going to be the final size. So, let us say that there are three abilities which this test is measuring. So, there will be questions relating to verbal ability, performance ability and special ability. Let us say question number 1, 5, 6, 8, 10 relate to verbal ability. Similarly, question number 2, 3, 4, 7 relate to performance ability in question number 8 and 9 relate to special ability. Then if these questions individually correlate among themselves this test is said to have internal consistency which means that the questions which is measuring verbal ability if they show high correlation the test is said to have or any matter for any any uh, measurement within the test any factor which is measured inside the test. If the question measuring that factors have high correlation among themselves, they are said to have internal consistency. And the last kind of reliability is called inter-judge reliability which is rating of judge on correlate highly. There are certain measurements or there are certain factors which cannot be measured through computer tests. For example, let us say beauty. How do you define beauty? Singing contest you have seen. How do you define singing? what is the underlying meaning of singing. So, what we do here is the measurement cannot be done through a computer test, we call in experts, judges and these judges have their own baseline and based on that they do the measurement or they give grades to people. So, their measurement is done through judges ratings and that is called the inter-judge reliability. So, if let us say 4 out of 3 judges 
give the same score to a person on a beauty contest, then this test or this contest is said to have something called interjudge reliability and that is what is interjudge reliability. Now, similar to reliability is another factor which is called validity. Now, reliability is how good, how consistent, how reproducible your test is. Validity is whether your test is measuring what it is supposed to measure. Now, there could be I could have a test of uh, happiness and I could have questions like how many times did you cry today and how often did you feel sad today. Now, these questions do not actually measure happiness and so if a test does not measure what it is supposed to measure is said to have no validity. Now, a test with a good validity is the one which measures what it is meant to measure. So, if a test of happiness is there it should measure it should have items of or it should have test items of happiness onto it. Now, there are three types to look at validity one is called the criterion or empirical validity. What is it? Correlating test scores with some external criteria can assess validity. Let us say there is a test of uh, happiness already existing in market and I develop a new test. Now, if my test gives the same score or nearly equal score to a test which is already there in the market and these scores match or correlate highly then we say that they have they have something called criteria or empirical validity which means that that particular test which is there in the market that that uses a criteria for measurement of happiness and my test gets score similar to that and so it is supposed to have something called criteria re relevant validity criteria problem in assessment now there are certain things certain features or certain type of constructs which cannot be measured or which has no criteria which has no test to measure. For example, a good example often given by psychologists is the idea of achievement motivation. How do we define achievement motivation? Now, achievement motivation when it was first being defined there was no way to come up with the idea or there was no test out there to come up with the idea of what is in uh, achievement motivation, what should I measure? Because achievement motivation in terms of salaried employees will be salary. Achievement motivation in terms of teachers will be how successful their students are. Achievement motivation uh, of some other group will be something else. So, how do I define questions for achievement motivation? What are the uh, factors which define achievement motivation? And so, where we do what we do there is and this kind of problem is called criteria related problem of assessment. And so, for achieving val validity there what we do is where there is no truth against which to validate the test. Now, if there is a truth, if there is a test out there based on which we can design our own test, it is supposed to have criteria validity. But assuming that there are no tests out there, there is no truth against which we can come up with or we cannot define a criteria. So, what do we do there? We generally use something called construct validity. Test scores correlate with predicted outcomes or the theory underlying that research. So, here what we do is we look at all the theories which measure achievement motivation. So, we looked at several theories which actually or the most popular theory that you want to define or that the most popular theory on which you want to base your test or achievement motivation. So, we looked at the theory and the theory had certain outcomes. There is a body of research which says that achievement motivation measures this, this, this and then we take our test and we measure the scores. Now, if my scores of the test matches with the theory's prediction of what should be achievement motivation and they correlate highly. So, test scores if my test scores correlate with theory's prediction the theory also says what is achievement motivation and if the row value is let us say 0 0.70 I say that my test has something called construct validity because the idea of achievement motivation is defined by some theory, the construct achievement motivation is defined by some theory and if my test predicts certain score, if it gives similar score to what the theory says then the test is supposed to have construct validity. So, this is how we, uh, these are the two factors of any test. First, whether it is reproducible or not, consistent or not and second, whether it measures what is supposed to measure or not and so that is what the two factors of any intelligent test is. Now, I have a intelligence test for you, you can do it on your own time. The first one is done for you 24 hours in a day and I will do the second one also, it says 26 letters 
of the English alphabet 7 days in the week and so as you can see this is how our intelligence test is. So, I just have an intelligence test for you to can do it on your own time. So, how do we measure intelligence? What is the basis of measurement of intelligence? Intelligence measurement started with someone called Binet, Alfred Binet. Truman and Alfred Binet, they were the first people who actually started measuring intelligence in Paris because the school council in Paris called these people and said that design a test for measuring school going children, measuring the intelligence of school going uh, children or abilities of school going children. Now, even before these people actually came up with the theory Alfred Binet which is called the Stanford Binet test uh, because in Stanford it was re-evaluated the test was or Binet's theory or Binet's idea of intelligence. Long before that there was someone called Galton who defined an intelligence test, but his test never actually became popular only his statistical technique became popular. And so, what Galton did was he used the idea of uh, Charles Darwin and designed a test and he said that the intelligence comes from inherited abilities. And so, there are some intelligent people in the world, inherited intelligent people in the world and so there are some stupid people in the world. And they he believed that the whites are most intelligence and so his theories had some idea of what intelligence is he said it is uh, how quick visual acuity versus reaction time versus so on and so. So, 5, 6 abilities is defined and said that most uh, English people or most white people have these abilities and they are very good intelligence. To prove his theory he took measurements from several people who came to a uh, fair in London at one point of time, several intelligent people whom he believed were intelligent and took the measurements, but none of them correlated with each other and his theory fell apart. The first actual theory of intelligence started with Alfred Binet, where the Paris Council asked him to define the intelligence test. So, Binet did not know what how to define intelligence. So, what did he do? The first attempt to measure intelligence was made by Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon on request of the Paris School Board. Paris School Board requested these two people to measure intelligence of school going children in Paris. So, what they said is please help us identify intelligent people or please give us a measure of how intelligence should be measured in school children. So, what did Binet and Simon do? So, Binet and Simon decided to use items of two basic types. They first constructed a construct called intelligence and then they defined a test of intelligence. Now, what does this test of intelligence have? The Binet Simon test had items which were so unusual that none of the children had prior exposure to them. So, some of the exam questions or intelligence questions which are given to people in intelligence tests were so unusual that none of the children actually were able to solve it and some questions were so familiar that almost all youngsters would have encountered them. So, there are two kind of questions that were taken. What Alfred Binet did was I will explain you through a chart here. So, let us say I am measuring the intelligence of 8 class students. Now, most 8 class students will be or let us say 6 class students most 6 class students will be of the age 11 years right assuming that you start school at 5 years. So, if you start school at 5 years by 11 years you will give this test. Now, the intelligence test that in Stanford and Binet I am sorry Binet and Simon had were having questions let us say from class 4 and 5. And these six class uh, children have to solve questions from class 4 and 5. Now, these were the so familiar questions. There are also so familiar unfamiliar questions where these six class students were given questions from class 7, 8 and 9 maybe 7, 8. So, unfamiliar that they had no idea. So, 7 was not given maybe 8 and 9 questions were for class and 8 and 9 questions were given to these people. So, there are questions which they are very familiar because they have been through to this class and questions which they had no idea and so that actually measured their IQ or intelligence. So, IQ is the meaning then and now how should we define the meaning of IQ. So, this is what the Binet and Simon test actually did and based on the scores that they got they gave them a value which is called IQ. What is IQ? IQ or intelligence quotient stands for intelligence quotient and is a quotient is that may 
precisely the scores. So, IQ is defined as this is a very old definition. So, changed a lot of times. IQ is mental age by chronological age into 100. What is chronological age? Chronological age is the so refer to the present uh, last example. Chronological age is the age of the children who are actually in class 6. So, as I said, class 6 children are 11 years old. And mental age is the questions that children of class 6 can solve. So, maybe you can solve questions for class 9. Let us say I am taking the IQ of AB. Now, this AB is in class 6 and has a chronological age which is the biological age 11 years and he can solve the problems of 9 class students. So, his mental age is 14 and so his IQ will be 14 upon 11 into 100 right that is the IQ of this person around uh, approximately around 100, 10, 120 is the IQ of this person right that is how this whole idea of IQ came about. Now, there is one problem with the IQ scores what at some point mental growth levels of or stops while chronological age continues to grow. Now, the dynamics of the brain suggest that by the age 13 years no new neurons are formed and so the measurement of mental age in the strictest sense this is this is the measurement of intelligence test in terms of how many questions can you solve for which age. Now, mental age actually should mean to how many new neurons you are actually uh, developing or the brain is developing because that that's, that signifies the, uh, the idea the concept of mental age. And so, as a result the IQ scores began to decline after age 13 because what happens is the mental age starts growing down. There is no new neurons growing and so your age mental age cannot go high and that is how this should gets fixated after 13 years of age. So, the definition of IQ today is changed and today IQ is simply reflects an individual's performance related to that of a person of the same age who has already taken this test. And so, nowadays the IQ is defined as your score against somebody who has taken that test. It is nothing to do with age, it is to do with somebody who has actually taken this test and when you take this test, what is the correlation between the both of your scores that is how IQ is actually defined and given the fact that they are the same age. So, two 11 class people taking a similar intelligence test, one how do they score? So, so one scores 30, the other scores 40, the correlation between them will tell the intelligence quotient or the IQ of these people. Now, the Stanford winning intelligence test typical example as, as I said one is verbal reasoning. So, you have vocabulary questions, comprehension questions, absurdities, verbal relations, you can have quantitative questions for example, number series, education building, you can have abstract reasoning questions where you have pattern analysis, copying and you have short term memory questions, bead memory, memory for sentences, memory for digits and memories for objects. Now, as you can see this test of intelligence which is Stanford and Binet test is actually an academic test. It requires you to have verbal skills, if it requires you to have read, reading and writing skills. But the problem is there are people in the world who have no reading and writing skills, not gone to school. What happens to them? Are they stupid? Because their intelligence cannot be measured through any of these. Look at the definition that is there of the intelligence. So, that was one, the, one of the problem. So, Binet and Simon's intelligence test has one major drawback. All contents of the test were verbal in nature. Now, to overcome this problem, David Weschler devised a set of tests for both children and adults that included non-verbal or performance items. As I said, most questions in the uh, Simon and Bire test were actually verbal items. As so, a small children who have no verbal ability, it is very difficult to come up with an example or to come up with a, a way to express the intelligence. Similarly, people who have not gone to schools, who have no verbal ability, it was very difficult for uh, Simon and Binet to explain how to measure their intelligence. So, we actually define a test which had non-verbal or performance items as well as verbal ones and that yielded sp separate scores for these two components of intelligence. So, Weschler later on defined something called the Weschler's adult intelligence test and this is what the Weschler intelligence test look, look like. This is the Weschler's adult intelligence scale questionnaire. The full scale intelligence question has two parts a verbal part and a performance part. 
the verbal IQ and the performance IQ. The verbal IQ has verbal comprehension index and the working memory index, two things language and memory. And in the within the verbal comprehension index, you have something called vocabulary test, you have similarities. So, two items are given, you have to find out how similar they are. A text is given and you have to speak it, maybe read it, get something out of it. Information, some kind of information is given to you and you have to actually relate that information back and comprehension, how good is your understanding. The working memory test has tests of arithmetic, how quickly you can do and math, digit span, certain numbers are there and manipulated, how do you look into it? Letter sequence, letter number sequencing, for example, certain letters and numbers occur in sequences and you have to actually tell what is the next in the sequence. Performance test has two parts, we have something called the perceptual organization index or the POI, which has picture completion test, so picture is given to you and you have to complete the picture. Block design, certain blocks are given and you have to complete the block in relation to a picture and matrix reasoning, so a matrix is given and you have to move certain items to complete the matrix. The processing speed index test has digit symbol coding, so there are certain digits and there are certain symbols and a code is provided to that which is non-verbal and so you have to match it and symbol search. So a uh, uh, maze is given to you where certain symbols are hidden and you have to quickly find out where the symbols are. So this is the recent version of the test. Now how does intelligence come about? The cognitive basis of intelligence. This viewpoint suggests that being intelligent involves being able to process information quickly. Now, as we have seen Anderson's theory, what Anderson says is that being intelligent is equivalent to how quickly you can process an information. That was called basic processing speed in, in terms of in, uh, Anderson's theory. Now, this has led to, to two major developments the new information processing theory. First new test based on findings of cognitive psychology emerged and due to this, this idea, this information processing view of intelligence, newer tests start coming in. Also speed of processing, simple perceptual and cognitive tasks correlate with scores and intelligence tests. So the intelligence tests, tests started being developed on idea of speed of processing. Perceptual and cognitive tasks were devised which actually measured something called speed of processing and that became the basis of newer intelligence test. And the third important factor is inspection time. So, intelligence was now measured in terms of inspection time which is the minimum amount of time a particular stimulus must be exposed to acquire a judgment that meets to some pre-established criteria of accuracy is the new measure of intelligence. What does inspection time actually mean? You have seen Rubik's cube. The time that it takes to you to get a Rubik's cube solved, a Rubik's cube has several colors, mainly six different colors on different sides and your job is to get all colors, similar colors on one side. Now the how much time it takes for you to get all colors of similar type on one side, maybe solve one side, maybe solve all the sides is what is inspection time. So number of moves, so pre-established criteria is getting all greens on one side, right. So this is how my Rubik's cube actually looks like. So this is the cube, right? And so it has something like this, and this is green, green. So getting all greens on this, these are all colored green, and getting all green on one side is what is Rubik's cube. So pre-established criterion, this is called the inspection time. Now there is also the neural basis of intelligence, and what does it say? This viewpoint suggests that nerve conduction velocity is responsible for intelligence. Now the speed with which nerve impulses are conducted in the visual system correlate significantly with the measure of intelligence and so this idea says that how quickly information passes from the eye through the nerve set of nerves the visual uh, nerves to the visual cortex that is defined as intelligence. So for some people it it moves at a very fast rate almost the, the 25 miles per hour is I think 25 miles per second or per hour is the uh, rate of nerve conduction velocity that is the standard rate but then it may vary from people to people and the more faster it moves in the uh, within the visual system is defined as intelligence. Also metabolic activities in the brain is a direct measure of intelligence. Intelligence people have different metabolic activities which means that more oxygen has taken up by the brain when they do certain jobs and that is reflected by different kind of activity in the brain or different kind of uh, patterns in the brain and this different kind of patterns rep represent and this difference is actually with a normal human being and if that happens is it is said to be intelligence. Also brain structures, certain brain structures are also known to have 
higher intelligence. For example, people with higher frontal cortex. Sherlock Holmes used to have a higher frontal cortex or a more developed frontal cortex and he is known to be more intelligent. So, because frontal cortex is known to do manipulations, decision making, working memory, all those uh, kind of stuff it is related to. So, different brain structures or uh, higher or, or a bigger hippocampus is, is known to have higher memory. So, different brain structures can also lead you to, to the idea that people are intelligent. So, uh, human intelligence the role of heredity and environment. So, that has been also been talked about that intelligence is uh, related to heredity. Now, human intelligence is the result of complex interplay between genetic factors and a wide range of environmental conditions. So, there are certain uh, rules or there are certain kind of uh, evidences which have been given evidence for the influence of heredity. The first evidence is with respect to family relationships uh, and measured IQ it has been confirmed that experiments that the more closely two persons are related the more similar they have IQ. So, people related together in terms of family have similar IQ and that says that heredity has an influence on intelligence. Similarly, findings involving adopted children, IQs of adopted children resemble more closely to the biological parents than the adopted parents. And so, it has been found that if there are two children and these two children are adopted by different different families, family 1 adopts first uh, ch child, the family 2 adopts second child. The intelligence of these two child is different from, so intelligence of child A and B which are in family 1 and 2, they will be similar to their biological parent than to their adopted parent. Also findings from studies that focus on the task identifying this specific gene that influence intelligence. Now, there are certain genes are known to have in fact in uh, uh, show that intelligence is genetic in nature. The view argues that many genes each exerting relatively small effects probably play a role in general intelligence that is in what may aspects of mental abilities, verbal, special and so have in common. So, it has been found that certain genes or individual roles of a number of genes they combine together to actually come up with the idea of what intelligence is. The role of heredity environment and so findings involving research on identical twins separated at infants who were then raised by different homes, IQs of twins reared apart correlated highly with and was similar to that of twins which are reared together that is another uh, finding. Now, on the basis of these results, it estimated that heritability of intelligence, the proportion of variance in intelligence within a given population that is attributable to genetic factors ranges from 35 percent in childhood to as much as 75 percent in adulthood and maybe 50 percent overall. So, it is said that basically the role of heredity intelligence is approximately 50 percent in most adults and vary between 35 to 70 percent. Evidences for influence of environment. So, performance on IQ test resonance substantially around the world at all age levels in a recent decade and this phenomenon is called the Flynn effect. What the Flynn effect says that as the uh, generations develop, the newer generations get more and more intelligent. The reason is they have a better environment, the a better uh, learning and so look at uh, your children or maybe your smaller brother and sisters, they are more intelligent than you, uh, you are. They can operate phones, they can op do so many things that you at your age cannot do and that basically is Flynn effect. It says that as generations move, people become more and more intelligent. A large number of factors are responsible for such an effect, better nutrition, increased urbanization, the advent of television, more and better education, more cognitive demanding jobs and exposure to computer games and these are the reasons why this Flynn effect actually comes into place. Another evidence for the role of environment factor in intelligence is provided by the finding and studies of environmental deprivation and environmental enrichment and what has happened is with respect to deprivation it was found that intelligence can be reduced by the absence of key forms of environmental stimulation early in life. Also as proof of enrichment removing children from sterile restricted environment and placing them in favorable ones can in increase the intelligence. It is found that people or children when in a, in a better environment when in a uh, enriching environment, they tend to become more intelligent, but if an intelligent child is taken to a depriving environment, then his intelligence decreases and so these are the uh, evidences which are out there. And so, some uh, basic things to look at what is emotional intelligence, you know as I said I will take a model system which is the emotional intelligence and basically try and make you understand what is intelligence and how emotional intelligence really work or a standard uh, model system. So, Daniel Goldman 1985 and 19, uh, 1988 defined emotional intelligence as a cluster of traits or abilities relating to the emotional side of life. So, he says that emotional intelligence is basically an intelligence of how intelligent you are emotionally. So, 
intelligence is just not academic intelligence there are other forms of intelligence also so daniel goldman came up with the idea of being emotionally intelligent and it has been found that people are uh, mostly not emotionally intelligent they do stupid things non rational things and that is because they become emotional and so this concept has been sold in that particular way and so he defined emotional intelligence as a cluster of traits or abilities relating to emotional side of life now he further states that this kind of intelligence is more important for a happy productive life than iq and so he defines there are some major components of emotional intelligence what are they knowing our own emotions he says that emotional intelligence depends upon how nicely we know our own emotions at times we don't know our own emotions we don't know what to do we don't know what we are feeling and that people are known to be emotionally inferior to the extent that individuals are not aware of their own feelings and they cannot make intelligent choices so once you don't know your own intelligence you will not be able to make intelligent choices since people are not aware of their own emotions they often low in expressiveness and so they cannot express the second factor is managing our own emotions so managing our own emotion is to regulate their nature intensity and expo exposure can you manage emotions so if you feel emotional if somebody makes you emotional can you manage your response that's another question and we'll look into emotion in the next section uh, perhaps the next lecture i'll describe what is emotion there and then maybe you'll have a better understanding of what we are going at motivating ourselves so remaining optimistic enthusiastic and delaying gratification till the final goal recognizing and influencing others emotions how good we are at recognizing other people's emotion the ability to read other people's emotion recognizing the mood and lastly handling relationships how good we are in interpersonal intelligence how good we can handle relationship among people our relationships with other people other people uh, between people across people and so on and so forth evidences on the existence and effects of emotional intelligence so there are several evidences which suggest that this kind of intelligence is there now with respect to first of these issues evidences is mixed all other issues have been found to have no stable foundations so the only uh, factor which actually worked in terms of daniel goldman's theory is knowing our own emotions so are people able to manage or understand their own emotions and can actually make intelligent choice based on their feeling that is the only factor which actually is stable or is is the one which is most likely the accepted view of emotional intelligence now as i said there are several factors that he gave on emotional intelligence but the only factor which is stable or which has been found to be consistent with the idea of emotional intelligence uh, when it is tested across many people is the idea of knowing your own emotion intelligence so that's the only factor which has actually survived now researchers have indicated that only one component of goldman's theory which is emotion perception ability to read accurately others emotions are strong evidence of intelligence like effect now researchers in this area in the area of emotional intelligence or intelligence suggests that most factors which daniel goldman has outlined as affecting emotional intelligence or as part of emotional intelligence do not look like intelligence do not look like a factor of intelligence what they suggest is the only factor which probably looks like as anything as intelligent or anything which is close which come closest to the definition of intelligence is the idea of emotion perception whether the ability to read accurately others emotion has strong evidences on intelligence so how good you are at reading other people's emotion and then behaving accordingly that is the only factor which has come close to the definition of intelligence and so this is the only factor which has been researched upon if we pick up a book on emotional intelligence this is the most widely accepted factor many researches are being done on emotional intelligence but this is the factor which is to be looked forward for now is the theory useless then because it has mentioned so many factors research offers the view that we don't have adequate methods for measuring all aspects of emotional intelligence also further these components may be independent of each other and so another one reason is that we do not have the tools and the constructs to measure all concepts that has been defined here in terms of emotional intelligence and so that may be one of the reason why we are not able to particularly understand emotional intelligence the way it has been defined in this theory also that components of emotional intelligence they don't show high correlation among themselves now as we looked at in terms of validity or in terms of reliability if components of emotional intelligence do not correlate among themselves they are not a good test which means that all of them are not measuring the same thing and so that is the reason because they have independent of each other that is the reason why this theory is actually not widely accepted or not scientifically accepted because they don't have something called uh, internal consistency the last section that we are going to do is something called creativity generating the extraordinary so what is creativity 
Creativity is defined as the ability to produce work that is novel, original, unpredicted and appropriate. It works and useful to meet task requirements. So, creativity generally is thought to produce works which are novel, which are different, which is out of the box. But then the scientific definition of creativity does not say that you come up with something which cannot be defined, which cannot be explained. That is not creativity. Coming up with something interesting is not creativity. Creativity has two factors into it. One factor is how do you come up with a new product? How do you come up with a new idea? And also whether it is workable or not. If the concept that you have come up with, if the solution that you have come up with a problem is not usable, is not useful, then it is not creative. So, creativity is coming up with new solutions, but also the fact that these new solutions should be workable. When Einstein gave the definition of uh, relativity, it actually could explain so many things which Newton could not explain through his uh, idea of gravitation. And so, Einstein's idea of gravitation, Einstein's idea of relativity actually explains so many factors which Newton could not and that is how it was creative, the solution was creative because it gave answers to so many explanations and also further led to the development of major theories, led to the development of newer uh, insights and that is what is creativity. The reason creativity was never studied extensively, so why is creativity not studied? Because there is no appropriate method exists that can capture all aspects of creativity in real life situations. There is no way to know how creativity is measured. There is no way to actually, uh, no appropriate method to define creativity as it has been defined in, in our world. Some people define creativity as creative spirit, some people define creativity as something else, uh, some people define creativity as inborn talent and so on and so forth. So, many people, many theories, there is no one consigns on what or there is no one uh, general view among workers, among researchers on creativity or what is creativity and so that is one of the problems which exists. Concepts of creativity was associated in many people's mind with forces outside the realm of science, for instance, with a vague notion of creative spirit. And because people believe that creativity is outside the concept of science, is outside the realm of scientific study, they believe that creativity is something which comes from spirit, which comes from inner uh, development, which comes from inner being, which comes from an uh, internal uh, factor, something like that. So, that is why creativity has not been studied till now. So, contrasting views of creativity, what produces creativity? Cognitive psychologists focus on the basic processes that underlie creative thoughts like retrieval of information from memory, association, synthesis, transformation and categorical reduction. What cognitive psychologists believe is that creativity is dependent on some basic processes and they have studied these basic processes and refined creativity. So, anybody who is coming up with a creative solution use something like retrieval of information how quickly so creative people can come up with multiple ways of accessing memory that is one thing to look at also association association between concepts in memory creative people have novel concepts association different concepts can be associated in different ways so that is one thing to look at then synthesis Creative people can understand not only concepts, but also can transform these concepts with, uh, to come up with newer concepts. So, synthesis coming up with new ideas and transformation and categorical reduction, transformation of concepts, transformation of knowledge and coming up with categorical reduction can reduce information based on categories and come up with newer solutions. So, these, these were how creativity was defined in terms of cognitive psychologists. So, studying creativity involves distinguishing between mundane and exceptional creativity. Creativity is two types, one is called mundane creativity, the very idea that take a spoon and from the spoon, the liver of the spoon, make it a liver and open a tin can, jar of a tin can is not actually creativity. So, there are two kinds of creativity, one is called mundane creative which solves your everyday problem, coming up with the jugad as it is said, that is one form of creativity. The other form of creativity is called the exceptional creativity which actually gives solution, a novel solution which has not been thought of, a novel solution which works and a novel solution which is out of the box. So, no theory exists and, and a way of solving a problem comes in, that is called exceptional creativity. Social psychologists have focused on personality traits and environmental conditions that encourage creative thinking. So, social psychologists believe that certain personality people and certain environmental conditions actually are related to creativity or creative solutions. Confluence approach of creativity, the approach suggests that in order to creative uh, to creativity to occur, multiple components must converge. So, creativity for creativity to come up, there are several factors which must converge. First, intellectual ability, the way to see problem in newer ways. 
So, somebody, if somebody can uh, actually see a problem in newer ways, in ways which is outside the box, will be creative. Knowledge, enough knowledge about the field. Somebody who doesn't have enough knowledge about the field cannot be creative. For example, if Einstein didn't knew mathematics and physics, can he come up with the idea of relativity? So, people who are creative have extensive knowledge about the field that they are studying. Creative styles of thinking, a preference for thinking in newer ways. So, people who are creative can start thinking of problems in newer ways, can tolerate something called absurdities, can tolerate something called uncertainties and so they can start thinking in number of uh, ways which is not acceptable uh, to the present knowledge domain. And personality attributes, traits as willing to take risk and tolerate ambiguity. Now, these people are able to take not only take risks where the solution does not work, but also uh, tolerate something called ambiguity. They are fine with ambiguous solutions, they are fine with uncertain situations. They can tolerate these kind of situations and environment that supports creativity. Certain kind of environments, for example, enriching environments, environment which gives you some kind of a, a boost are very good with creating creativity. And so, creativity has been defined as a concept which is related to these five factors. Now, as I said, it is related to intellectual ability, how nicely you can come up with problems. Also, a broad and risk knowledge base, how much do you know that particular area and appropriate flexible thing, uh, kind of thinking. So, you can think in flexible ways, certain personality types, for example, you can take risk and tolerate ambiguity and an environment which supports this. So, all these together is called the confluence approach. of creativity right so this is what creativity is all about and so that concludes our section on intelligence in today's lecture so quick recap of what we did today we looked at two parameters of any intelligence test namely reliability and validity and we defined how reliability and validity is actually measured then we looked at certain standard tests of intelligence we looked at the Theodore Simon test, we looked at the uh, Weschler test, Binet and Simon test of intelligence and describe how these tests are made, what are the constraints of this test and so on and so forth. Then we discussed the idea of create uh, in intelligence in terms of the cognitive view and in terms of the brain view or the neural view. Then we moved on to defining a model system of uh, intelligence which is emotional intelligence and dealing with it and lastly we took up the idea of what is creativity and how is creativity measured or uh, the different parts of creativity how these parts amalgamate together to form creativity and so creativity and intelligence uh, emotional intelligence and creativity and intelligence go hand to hand together so we didn't focus too much on to creativity uh, but since creativity goes on with intelligence so we discussed this the concept on emotional intelligence, the idea on emotional intelligence will carry forward from here because when we meet next, we will be discussing on something called emotional intelligence. So, we will be discussing the concepts from emotional intelligence and I will be introducing to uh, you to the concept of what is emotion and from there you can follow up a little bit about what is intelligence. So, when we meet next, we will be discussing the ideas of what is emotions and a little bit of what is motivation. So, up, up till we do that and meet next, it is goodbye.